Good Lord. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord on the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence and sing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. The uh, first uh, thing that's been on my heart the last few weeks has been Haiti uh, with both the uh, major earthquake that they had here a couple of weeks ago and then the, the hurricane they had just right on the hills of that, not even cleaning up from the earthquake that they had the, uh, uh, the hurricane. And then uh, the second thing more recently and uh, more on the news now and, and further away is Afghanistan, the situation there with uh, the Americans, Westerners, and supporters of the former government um, trying to get out of the country and being cut off uh, from the airport in many cases and, and the uh, angst there. So anyway, let's go to the Lord uh, uh, this morning in prayer as we think about uh, some of our uh, uh, problems in our world. Our Heavenly Father, uh, I lift up to you the Haitians that we, uh, that, that are struggling this morning. Uh, many are hopeless. Um, many just feel like that they just don't know where to turn. Father, I pray, Lord, for endurance for them, uh, that you'd give them hope 
and encouragement. I pray, Father, for those Christian ministries that are operating in Haiti and have been operating in Haiti for years. Father, that you would um, just strengthen them um, as they try to reach out to the Haitians uh, to help them, uh, whether it be in, in rebuilding or just the medical needs that they're experiencing there right now. Uh, Father, that they would be able to, to minister uh, to them both physically and also spiritually, Father, that they would uh, have uh, use this opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those they are hurting in Haiti. And Father, we pray, Lord, for those uh, Americans and Westerners and other supporters of the former Afghan government. Father, as, as many of them are uh, cut off, uh, many of them feel hopeless as far as not seeing how they're going to be able to get out of the country if they are, in fact, going to be able to, to get out of the, uh, the country, Father. Uh, I pray, Lord, endurance for them, uh, encouragement for them. Father, I pray for the refugees uh, that, are, that are fleeing the country, Father, that, uh, that you would give them hope. I pray, Lord, for the countries that uh, the refugees will cross into. Father, that they would be able to uh, uh, welcome them and that they wouldn't be overwhelmed uh, also with uh, uh, ministering to those in need there that are uh, trying to escape the, uh, the, the the new government that they have been setting up. And Father, I pray for our military uh, that's over there in Afghanistan as they are trying to rescue uh, Americans um, to... Um, to get them out of the country safely. Father, I pray for the military that you would keep them safe as they try to rescue uh, other people. And Father, I pray for um, the families of the fallen military members over the last 20 years. Father, as this uh, is opening up a fresh wound to many of them. Father, I just pray, Lord, uh, that you would comfort, uh, comfort the families, Father, um, during this time. And Father, I pray for the uh, disabled uh, military uh, members that have been disabled over the, the last 20 years serving in Afghanistan. Father, that uh, they would be strengthened and you just give encouragement uh, to them uh, today. And uh, Father, I pray for those Christians that will remain uh, in Afghanistan, Father, uh, that you would encourage, uh, embolden them, Father, and that you would use this time and in the days and months and years ahead uh, for the spread of the gospel um, and that you're, you would be glorified through this, Heavenly Father. Now I pray that you just continue to guide our time of worship. Amen.
and his love for us is so amazing. Heavenly Father, we once again approach you and approach the scriptures, asking that you would grant to us the ability to understand the depth and the magnitude of the words that we find there. Help us to go beyond just a mental ascension where we can see the words on the page and just generally agree to it. But Father, let our whole lives reflect the fact that we believe these words. May our thoughts, may our actions, and may our words all agree about the goodness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> For I pray this in His name. Amen. If you would grab a Bible and join with me in the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter. Jesus is speaking with his disciples after Judas has left. And beginning in verse number 12. We find these words, John chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you, 
that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Now, one thing I have never been accused of is being a three-point preacher. Uh, I have generally shied away from that style of preaching because I found when I, I tried to do it at the beginning of my ministry, I was really kind of forcing several points into the text just to kind of round things out. So I, I shied away from that. But when I came to this passage, there were three things about these verses that struck me and I want them to strike you with the same magnitude. And so I'm going to share with you today three points that I want us to see in this text and marvel at what they are. Now you might think I would start with the, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. But actually I kind of preached that in chapter 14. This is not the first time Jesus has said those words in this kind of section. And so I'm not going to spend as much time on that part. I'm going to pick it up there primarily in verse 13. With a greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. And the first thing that really strikes me in, in hearing that is the reality and the realization that Jesus laid down his life for me. Now, when you when you break that that sentence down, and, and each of you here today, as you put your your trust in Jesus Christ, you are able to say today, Jesus laid down his life for me. And when you think of the reality of who Jesus is, when you stop and ponder for a moment that. He was there in the beginning. He was before there was an earth. Jesus was there. And Jesus was in perfect communion with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. They were complete and content, needing nothing. And yet, they created the universe and they created this little speck in the universe called earth and they spent a week organizing and creating the earth in such a way that every step that's here is necessary for the steps that would follow they organized it and then out of who knows exactly why, they said, let us create man in our own image. And they fashioned Adam and they fashioned Eve. And Jesus was doing that. Jesus was there breathing breath and breathing life in the dust. And there was Adam. The author of life experienced death for me. The Holy One who knew no sin, who was able to go through day after day after day, living in this earth and putting up with humans, and not once did his mind go against how God would have his mind be. I can't make it to Walmart. <clears throat> he made it through his entire life always honoring his parents. Always keeping the Sabbath holy. Never having anyone above his father. Never stealing anything, never speaking a deceitful word, never coveting what other people had that he did not. 
and yet willingly. He not only laid down his life, but he did so in one of the most excruciating ways known to humanity. And he did that for me. He did that for you. If we were not to have another thought the rest of the day, would that one thought not be enough? Just that the fact that your creator laid down his life for you? Can, I mean, Jesus here lays down this greater love as no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. But if it's possible, Jesus even went above his own statement. Because in Romans chapter 5, we read these words, beginning in verse 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for righteous purposes, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, we can look to modern examples of when people actually give up their lives for, for others. You know, a parent giving up their life for their child. We, we get that. All right, that makes sense. Or a soldier laying down his life for the country that he loves. We, we've seen that. We, we get that. And then we start to get a, little, a missionary laying down his life for his God. We applaud that. We get that. But right now, would you lay down your life for a member of the Taliban? Would you lay down your life for those people who have determined it is their goal in their life to take away yours? Would you say for your benefit, I, I will I will end my life for your benefit? Would, would you be able to physically do that? And yet God saw you in your full evil condition and said, I will give up my son for you. There is no greater love than that. And Jesus tells this to his disciples hours before he would be grabbed, put on a fake trial, beaten, bruised, and crucified. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. The first thing I marvel at is Jesus laid down his life for me. But here's, here's the next thing, and I, I don't get it. Jesus calls me his friend. Now at first, you know, all right, I'm a pretty nice guy. I got a couple of friends. They like me. All right, that's not so. I mean, really, we're friendly people. If Jesus was here, we'd be friends with him, right? I mean, we'd, we'd tell some good jokes with him, and hopefully he'd want to go out and eat where we wanted to eat. And we'd all build that friendship. And we like to think of our relationship with Jesus. How many times do we say, you know what, he's my best friend? <coughs> we, we throw that out there. I mean, I even used to have a t-shirt that my wife hated. Right now she's even growing because she knows what I'm about to say. I had this one foot just covered her face, even. I love it. I had, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. I mean, right? I mean, isn't that the way? I mean, Jesus loves me. This I know. Of course Jesus would call me his friend. What's there not to, we, we think this way. Until we start to really examine that statement and realize, you know what, friendship has to go two ways. And how many friends that we currently have would we still call friends if every single day they betrayed us? They would say nice things when they're around you. 
They might even gather together with other people and tell that whole group, oh, how wonderful they are. Let me just tell you. Oh, how I love Stephen. Oh, all right, you might do that, right? It's just always oh, great. But then the instant you turn away, the instant you leave the group, you start doing all of those things that would repulse. How many friends would you have if every day they betrayed you? I can tell you my answer. Zero. And if somebody betrayed me every single day, I am ready to say enough is enough. I don't need you. But do you realize that Jesus knows not only the ways that you have betrayed him, he knows the ways that you will betray him, and yet he says to you, you are my friend. Amen. Amen. And because he is the divine son of God, our Savior is willing and able to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and it will never stop. It doesn't matter how many times you betray. It doesn't matter how many times you say, I swear I'll never do it again. And then the next day you do it again, you know what he'll do on that day? He will forgive you again. It blows my mind that Jesus, knowing what I've done and what I will do, is willing to say, you are my friend. Because I haven't always been a good friend to him. He's been an amazing friend to me. But it has been, honestly, the most one-sided relationship ever known in history. Jesus looks at them and says, you are my friends. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Jesus is telling us the greatest mysteries and the secrets of the universe just revealing them to us and what the Father is doing and how he loves us, how he's working and what he wants. And Jesus has said, I have held nothing back from him. He's told us the hard things that was hard for us to hear, but we needed to hear. Jesus was willing to tell us those things. He was willing to tell us when we were just wrong. And he was willing to put up with us for some reason. When we continued to do the wrong thing after he told us the right way to do it, we, we went and did the exact opposite of what he told us to do. And at the end of the day, he looks at us and says, you are my friend. That blows me away. But I told you there'd be three things that I marvel at. So first, I marvel at the fact that Jesus laid down his life with me. Second thing I marvel at is that he's willing to call me friend. But this is where it really starts to get crazy. Verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. You ever stop and think about how you go about choosing your friends? I mean, think back, you know, when you were in school or when you were in an office place or maybe some of you that's still right now. Think about it. When you get into that room and there's nobody in there that you know, how did you single out who was going to be your friend and who wasn't? When you're younger, usually it has things to do with who has the right kind of lunchbox, right? You know, you look at their lunchbox, oh, they've got a Star Wars lunchbox. They must be cool. I want to be friends with them. Right? Or, you know, maybe it's a shared musical interest. You know, oh, they like that band, I like that band, and you start to hit it off. Sometimes it's because your personalities just, they just click. You know, you just, for whatever reason, things are good. If you decide to be 
friends. But if you remember back in school or even in work, and sometimes still today, where there's group projects, may they be cursed for all eternity. But there's there's cursed there's, there's cursed projects, group projects, and you get put into a group with three other people, and you're forced to spend time with them. But you decide about halfway through, when this project's done, I ain't ever talking to this person again. Is there an amen in the room? Amen. Right. You notice there are certain people we choose not to be friends with. Sometimes it's just because they're jerks. Other times it's because they're lazy. Or sometimes, yeah, just don't get along. Do you realize... Jesus chose you. He had all of creation to choose from. The millions and billions of people that had walked this planet. And he saw you from your birth to your death. See, the first time you would roll your eyes at your parents? See, the times that you would steal things that didn't belong to you? He heard every word that would come out of your mouth. He saw every tear. He saw every time you rejoiced at things you shouldn't rejoice at. And yet he looked at you and said, I want you. Can we not marvel at the fact that the creator of the universe chose you? We like to give ourselves a lot of credit. We like to say, well, it was on this date on the calendar is when I decided that I would follow Jesus. I looked into all of the facts. I looked into all of the evidence. And that is when I came to the almighty conclusion that my faith would best be handled in the hands of an almighty God who sent his son. Can, can we do away with that language? Can we move away from the language of saying, I accepted Jesus to start saying, this was the day that Jesus accepted me? Can we put it in his hands instead of our own? I mean, can, can we start to realize and let the impact just overcome us more and more that I can't pat myself on the back for being smarter than everyone who's not here today, but the reality is for whatever reason, God saw you and chose you. He laid down his life for you. He calls you his friend. And he picked you. You were not the last one chosen for the kickball team. He chose you. Before you were born, he chose you. Well, what if I mess it up? You can't because he chose you. But what if I start doing all kinds of stupid things? He'll forgive you because he's your friend and he chose you. Yeah, but there are no you buts. He holds you. And our friend does not let go of our hand, no matter how much sometimes we want him to. He never lets go. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. If Jesus laid down his life for you, then is it not only right that we should be willing to lay down our lives for others who Christ laid his life down for? That if he did not think his life was too worthy to lay down, we should not think our lives too worthy to lay down? That if God was willing to look at us unlovely people and call us friends, should we not call others friends that the world would ridicule and mock and shame? 
Should we not do these things not out of a rigid obedience, but should we not do these simply because we have experienced such a great love that we can't help but it flowing out through us and infecting those people who are around us? Christ laid down his life for you. While you were still a sinner, the reality is that every single one of us, we, we can look at our lives. It doesn't take much for us to realize we are a sinner. It's not hard for us to think about the fact that we've told lies in our lives. That makes us liars. It doesn't take much for us to realize we've stolen things that didn't belong to us. That makes us thieves. And that means we are worthy of a judgment against us. And there's nothing you can do to make up for it. There's no penance that you can do that will get it right. So instead, while we were sinners, Christ came. He lived that perfect life that we didn't live and gave up his life and died on the cross for our sins. They buried it. It was over. <coughs> Until three days later when he rose again. When he walked out of that tomb. And that means he is still able to be our friend today. Will you trust in what he has done for you? And thereby be saved. Let's pray today. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask today that you would help us to realize those three great truths we see in that passage. That Christ laid down his life for us. We know, Father, that you love this world so much that you sent your Son. That all those who believe in him would not perish but would have eternal life. And we marvel at that reality. The author of life experiencing death for our sake. Father, help us to understand more and more of what it means that Jesus calls us friends. Help us to realize that it means that he's forgiven us greatly and that as a response, we should forgive those who are around us. <clears throat> Even when they fail us time and time and time again. Father, help us to understand what it means that you chose us. Help us to have the security that comes with that and knowing that nothing is able to snatch us from your hands. So help us to trust and believe and thereby worship you rightly today. For I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we sing this last song, if you need to come up and just pray at the altar, thanking God for what he has done for you, this altar is open for you. If you've never publicly acknowledged that you believe in Jesus Christ, I want to give you this opportunity to come and share that with me as we sing this song. If you need to respond to God, now is the time to do it. Let's stand as we sing.
seated. I'm going to share with you a little bit of how we're going to do communion. For many of you, it will be familiar. Uh, we are going to bring the plates and the elements to you today. We are going to be passing those elements uh, out to you. As you take one from the tray, we ask that you would hold on to it. Uh, that we wait for everybody to be served so that we can all partake of communion together as one family today. Now, if you are not a member of Northeast Park Baptist Church, but you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we welcome you to join with us in this. You do not have to be a member of this church. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, we would ask that you not partake uh, in this. And, and here's why. We are saying something very real about what we believe when we eat this uh, bread and when we drink this juice. We are proclaiming that we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And that that is the only way that we are saved through what he has done. So if you don't believe that, don't say it. We're not going to put a spotlight on you. Just when the tray comes, just pass it along and everything will be okay. Let's receive. Let's pray together before we go on to communion. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now at this time rejoicing. And Lord, what we are about to remember is the most horrific moment in the history of this world. And yet at the same time, it is the most wonderful moment in the history of this world. We are remembering when Christ died on the cross for our sins. And Father, it is because of our sin that he had to do it. And for that, we are ashamed at ourselves. We are ashamed at the way we continue to sin, even though we've been told better and we know better. And so there's a very real part of each and every one of us here right now that doesn't feel worthy of what Christ did. And yet, Father, we are here remembering and celebrating that it was not based on our worthiness that Christ laid down his life. It was based on his love for his friends that he chose. So, Father, as we celebrate this communion together, we pray, Lord, that we would do so in remembrance of Him. Amen. Amen.
life for his friend. Jesus laid down his life for you, the body of Christ. Take now. Scripture then goes on to tell us that in the same way, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he blessed it. He said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so the Lamb of God shed his blood for you. Take now and drink. Will you stand with me? Can I encourage you to go here rejoicing today? You've been chosen by God, and He loves you. Who cares what everybody else does? 
Let's receive the benediction together as one family. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, thank you for pouring out your love and mercy and grace upon us. For we have not deserved any that we have received. And now, Father, as we leave this place today, guard our hearts and our minds by granting us your peace. Amen. Amen.